everybody. Good morning, Crab Island. Those are out of AJ's, those of you watching online. We have a few people in the building, so glad that you could join us today. And with me is Caroline, our youth pastor here at Shoreline Church. So excited to be here. And we're happy to have you back. I know. He's been gone. It is. I've been gone for, well, I've been in town. It was our (laughs) 35th wedding anniversary. And so we did not uh, go anywhere. But I did attend church down at AJ's, and I attended church at Crab Island a couple times. So I got to be around, check out all the different locations. So it's good to be back, sort of. We're We're glad you're back. (laughs) I'm glad. You know, it's it's uh, it's so crazy how things have changed in just a month. I mean, it felt like we were kind of coming out of the COVID thing in June, but now it feels like are we going back in? Because it's like. Um, yeah, you know, and then of course, in the month of June, we talked about bridge over troubled waters, and that was about the whole racial tensions, which have not died down. So no. it's kind of becoming difficult to navigate the Absolutely. complexities of what's happening in America. I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, <laughs> I feel like me trying not to offend people offends people. Oh yeah, I mean, people go, "Are you trying to be offensive?" I'm like, "No, you must not know me. I don't have to try. It just comes naturally." <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh my but goodness. yeah, and because so because of that, we kind of want to have a talk today. It's a little bit different. I want to talk to church people. So if you're a church person out at Crab Island or AJ's or you're watching online, I really feel like this talk is for you. But if you Lean aren't in. a church person, like you, and what I mean by that is you didn't grow up in church or maybe you did and you went to college and for whatever reason, you kind of left the church or maybe you don't have any church background and you're right. out on a boat at Crab Island and you're just walking down the boardwalk there at Arbor Walk and stumble across the AJ's thing. I, I don't get disconnected because this, even though I'm talking to church people, I think what we're going to have to say, I think we'll either do two things. It'll ex- either explain why you haven't wanted to be around church or you might actually stand up and applaud uh, what I'm asking church people to do. I think it'll encourage people. Me too, because I, I think that if the church really lived out what we're going to talk about, uh, I think more people would want to be involved in it. Absolutely. Be a part of it, you know, because if you grew up in church, especially in Western culture, you probably grew up uh, believing that being a Christian is easy. Because sometimes people say that. They go, hey, just pray this prayer that all you got to do is believe that Jesus Christ right. paid, uh, paid for your sin. You received the free gift of get- salvation. You pray a prayer, and now you can call yourself a Christian. But the truth is, you don't find anything in the New Testament about people becoming a Christian. <laughs> in fact, you may not know this, but first century Christians didn't even call themselves Christians. It no. was really a derogatory term. It literally meant one associated with following Jesus. So it wasn't so much of a static description like, you know, being American or being in a Floridian. It was really describing a way of life. And the term Christian only shows up three times in the Bible. Wow. Now, Luke tells us about it. Luke is a writer of one of the of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay, that describe the life of Jesus. And then he wrote a book called Acts, which is about after Jesus left and the Acts of the Church. And he tells us about the first time they were called Christians. Now, if you want to follow along, if you're out at Crab Island or at AJ's or online, if you download our app, you can actually go to sermon notes and you can read these scriptures for yourself. But here's what it says in Acts chapter 11. It says, so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And then here's what we're talking about. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, I've highlighted the word disciples because it raises a question. Who were the disciples? Now, we tend to think of the disciples as the 12 apostles, the original followers of Jesus. But in the New Testament, disciple actually refers refers to Jesus followers. Now, the reason... Christians was a derogatory term is because the first century Jesus followers were actually accused of being a part of a cult. 
which Uh-oh. I've been accused of that as well. <laughs> and the reason it was because Judaism or Christianity or the this new way was was kind of a break off of Judaism, so they called it a sect. In fact, it was called a Nazarene sect. And the reason was because they followed a teacher from Nazareth. So as the pr- persecution breaks out into Jerusalem and these Jesus followers begin to spread to other cities, the citizens of Antioch were pressed to come up with a name for him. They didn't know what to call him, so they just called him Christians. Now, here's what we want to wrestle with today, is we believe that it's easy to say that I'm a Christian. But the real question is, can you say, is am I a Jesus follower? That's a big difference. It is, and some, pe- some people have never heard this before. But the question is, are we following or are, are we simply believing? And the reason why this is so important, in fact, it's almost terrifying, is because you can define and redefine the term Christian until you're fine. We can redefine the the term Christian until it fits my narrative and everything's fine. I'm good, okay? But to be a Jesus follower, that doesn't need defining and redefining, but it's a lot more difficult. Absolutely. You know, you know, and I think about Jesus, whenever he was talking, he never said anything about becoming a Christian. Yeah. It wasn't like a membership program or joining a sorority or fraternity or a boat club. He actually, <laughs> he invited- Those are your Crab Island watch. <laughs> well, wait a minute now. Yeah. He invited people to come follow him. That was part of the journey of Jesus. He wanted people to come follow. You know, and, and in first century history, Following Jesus actually costs something. Yeah. Where, where, whenever we think about becoming a, a follower of Jesus today, it may not cost us like it used to, but it does cost some things. Right. Maybe your popularity, or it's not it's not the popular way to go about things. I think about that scripture where Jesus talks about like wide is the path and narrow is the gate to go through. You know, some of the the Christians in that day or the people that followed Jesus, they had a very high cost of following him. You know, in Matthew five. It comes to a time where Jesus is actually inviting them to sit down and learn about the Sermon on the Mount. It's his most famous sermon that he yeah. he ever does. And in, in Matthew 5, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down, which I think it's interesting that he chooses to sit down in front of a crowd of people, right? Yeah. And invites them to come close. There's that following concept. And, and he says, His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. You know, these guys have no idea that they are— eyewitnesses to one of the biggest sermons of all history. Or a biggest event. I mean, that's not just a sermon. I mean, this <laughs> right. thing is huge, huge. It's a huge event. And I think about in my own personal life, I've had a couple moments where I've looked back and I've gone, that was a big moment and I had no idea. Yeah. But this is the Sermon on the Mount. That's yeah. even bigger. For me, I remember whenever I was younger, I, I went to, to see the World Trade Center and the Twin Towers. I was on a school trip. And the next year was the year of 9-11, whenever the the Twin Towers were hit. And I remember coming home from school that day, and in my bedroom at my desk was a picture of me and my best friends just smiling, standing in front of that, you know, the Twin Towers. And I looked back and I went, wow, that was a monumental moment. I can never do that with friends again. Yeah. I mean, have you ever had a moment oh, yeah, like yeah. that? Uh, speaking of New York, I used to live in New York, and in 1980, 40 years ago, I went to see Elton John in concert in Central Park. It was the biggest concert ever held in Central wow. Park. Over 300,000 people there. I remember I took my dog, and I. <laughs> when you have a dog, you can't really get to the front, but I actually had my friends hold the dog, and I worked my way all the way to the very front. And Elton John and his encore, he came out in a costume, uh, uh, dressed like Daffy Duck. <laughs> And um, at the time, I thought, oh, yeah, cool. I got to see Elton John. But I look back, and 40 years later, people are still talking about it. Right. I didn't realize the significance of how that concert that made history. It's but huge. these people were at the Sermon on the Mount. Right. I mean, <laughs> gosh, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, back in 2013, I took a group of teenagers to London, and that was an amazing experience. Let me just tell you. Did you get tea with the queen? Yeah, no, but very close. Really? Yeah, so a group of me and students, we had planned to go to the queen's palace and see it. And as we rolled up, there she was. It was the 60th Coronation Day Parade. Wow. Now, whenever I watch The Crown on Netflix, I'm like, I've seen her in person. <laughs> you might even be able to see a picture on the screen. Yeah. Um, but but I think about these these followers of Jesus. They were at the Sermon on the Mount. Like, I think it's cool that I saw the Queen, but they were at the Sermon on the Mount. I know. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, yeah, because I was thinking about this as we were talking about, because I thought about some other events besides, because I got to see the Miami Hurricanes play in the Orange Bowl in wow. the last year that they played in the Orange Bowl, <laughs> and they tore that down. I had no idea they were tearing it down. If I would have, I would have probably grabbed a piece of sod because <laughs> history was made in the Orange Bowl. The right. Miami Dolphins did their undefeated season there, won a Super Bowl. The Miami Hurricanes won six national championships. Wow. You know, and all of those moments are so cool, but none of these moments are we going to be talking about in 2000 years. No. I mean, these people are at an event that would shape Western civilization, right. that would reshape shape cultural values and norms. So you got the Sermon on the Mount. These people have got a crowd there. They have no idea how big this is going to be, that that we're going to be talking about it over 2,000 years later. Jesus begins to stand up and teach, and now this is his first sermon. And he literally turns everything upside down. He says, oh, you've heard it said, love your neighbors. I'm telling you to love your enemies. He says, "Uh, give away your stuff. If someone asks you for something, give them more. If someone, It is radical. If someone wants to borrow something from you, give it to them and don't ask it for it back. Go the extra mile, turn the other cheek. He says, you, he, he said, you can't be right with God until you make it right with your brother. You can't have peace with God until you have peace with your family. So you might have been, he said, if you go to the altar, you're there, you're waiting an hour to get in line to offer your sacrifice and you realize that you're not right with your neighbor, your brother, I want you to go home and get right with them. Wow. So he's- Could you imagine? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> unbelievably radical stuff. He said, you know, the eye for an eye, not anymore. And so when Jesus taught at the Sermon on the Mount, this was, it was epic. It, it was it was disturbing. He turned the entire world's value system completely upside down. And so he finishes this long sermon that just completely radicalizes and transforms even our country 2,000 years later right. in what we believe is you know values. And then he just kind of drops the mic and he starts heading for Capernaum. And here's <laughs> what happens in Capernaum. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. So he taught differently than those that were in the religious right. system. And of course he had authority. He was the son of God, right? <laughs> it says, but when Jesus came down from the mountainside, the crowds followed him. So it was like a big street party. They did, He didn't just leave this teaching. Now they're all following him everywhere he goes. Now you got to remember, nothing has ever happened like this before. I mean, yes, you had some crowds following John the Baptist, but John the Baptist would be the opening band. Like, right. you know, it would be like seeing, you get to see the Beatles and who's going to open for them? I don't know. You know, <laughs> somebody, right? This was the main event. And so he taught as one of authority. He's up there teaching. They're thinking, wow, maybe this guy is the Messiah. So he leaves He leaves there, goes to Capernaum, and when he gets there, a man with leprosy shows up. Now, let me just say, that was kind of a, a downer. Right. Because here he had just this, he had this life-changing message, this world-changing message, and suddenly this guy who has leprosy, he isn't even wearing a mask, all right? <laughs> Can you imagine? So everybody's like, <gasps> you know, that's not politically correct, and look what happens. A man with leprosy, verse 2 came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, remember, Jesus had just taught, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted, right? Right. That's some big talk, but now. It's time for him to walk it out. Yeah, what's he going to do, right? It says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. He said, I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. The crowd goes wild, (laughs) right? This guy doesn't just, he's not like the preacher that stands up there and tells you how to live your life, and then you find out he had an affair. This guy walks his talk. I mean, he's doing for others what he talked about. He's the real deal. He's actually living out these values. But then what happens next, it's it's kind of lost on us because we weren't there, but it wasn't lost on the people in this crowd because uh, in Matthew's first century readers, it wasn't lost on them either. That's why Matthew doesn't elaborate on it, but everybody there knew the significance of what happened next because suddenly you've got this, he did this awesome message, then heals this Jewish man who has leprosy, leprosy, but then something happens next where everyone's like, oh, what's going to happen? Right? <laughs> I mean, it's- right. So it kind of reminds me of, you know, I work with students, right? So it reminds me of like a teenager, a guy and a girl being down in their basement. They're making out. And Ooh. suddenly— I like the story. No, uh-oh. I'm just kidding. Suddenly, 
the girl's dad walks in and flips on the lights and everybody goes, <gasps> yeah. right? If this guy is telling his friends about this, his friends are not going to say, how did you feel in that moment? I, I felt think, like peeing in my pants. Right. Yes. <laughs> we all know how he feels. What is What, what his friends are saying is, what's going to happen next? That's right. And so for Jesus in this moment, he, he kind of had a lights turn on moment where it's like, okay, the tension and everything's turning. Yeah, because everybody is, what happens next, everyone is going, okay, what is he going to do? So Matthew didn't have to explain the tension here because everybody felt it. And here's what happened next. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. And when that happened, I'm telling you, every you could hear a pin drop. I was going to say, it got silent. It was like walking into a bar and the, and the record player goes, and everyone's just quiet, right? Right. Because this was beyond anything they could comprehend. Because, you know, Jesus... Look, love your enemies, that's a great hashtag, right? <laughs> Loveyourenemies.com, go get your picture taken in front of our building. That's awesome. Great Instagram picture. Yes. Healing fellow Jews, that's so nice. But this is a whole nother level. And let me tell you why. You got to have some historical context if you don't know. A hundred years before this event, there was a Roman general that powered his way through Judea, leveling towns, gets into Jerusalem, conquers Jerusalem. And the first thing he wants to do is go in and see this God that he's heard so much about, this Jewish God that's too good to have any other gods. You know, Rome had a pantheon of gods and so did the Greeks. It's, he's too good. In fact, he says he's the only God, that all the other ones are, are, are fake, you know? And so this Roman emperor, Pompey, he says, I want to go see this God. So he forces his way past the priests. He goes, goes into what they call the Holy of Holies, which is really just a God chamber. Every religion had a chamber right. where they kept their gods in there. Rome had it as well. Pushes his, pulls aside this elaborate curtain and walks in there. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, there was a golden box and some dishes and stuff, but there was no statue. He's probably there were, like, what in the world yeah, is Yeah, I'm this? sure he had to be disappointed and think these crazy Jews— worship something that isn't, they don't even have a picture. They don't have a statue. There's no <laughs> image of him. So he walks out of there and with disgust, but not before he takes all the wealth of Jerusalem and thousands of Jews back with him to Rome as slave slaves. And this begins a hundred years of rule and occupation and tyranny and Cycle. theft and oppression. Yes. And it included other emperors and other kings. They put kings there to rule Jerusalem that were just puppets of Rome, like King Herod the Great, who was called the King of the Jews. But to add insult to injury, he wasn't even Jewish. <laughs> and he ruled the Jews with viciousness. He was he killed his own mother-in-law. Well, that doesn't he make was you intense. vicious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you had Pilate. Pilate Pilate, Pilate was so vicious that he was actually recalled back to Rome because he was too vicious. He was the one that introduced crucifixion to the, to the area of Judea. And so anything that had to do with Rome was extremely tainted. It was offensive. So when this Roman centurion walks up, everyone is like, what does he want? And, and, but it gets worse because a centurion wasn't just a soldier. Right. A centurion, they were severe discipline, d disciplinarians. They were the ones that carried out the tortures. They, they did were, not like, play. No. And, <laughs> and, and they, they recruited sadistic people for these. To, they were Ugh. the ones that carried out the torture on Jesus the night before he was betrayed. <laughs> and they were known for even flogging their own men and even executing their own men. But it gets worse than that because we know, I love history. I know you do too. <laughs> we know from history that there were actually no Roman citizen centurion stationed in Galilee until about 70 AD. So most of these centurions were recruited from around the neighboring countries around Judea. And these people in these regions, they detested the Jews. Mm. They considered Jews to be racist. Uh, in fact, if we, they, well, for good reason, Jews weren't allowed, their rules didn't allow them to be around non-Jews. They couldn't eat with non-Jews, do business with non-Jews. They couldn't marry with non-Jews. They were very fiercely protective of their culture. Lots a lo of rules. Oh yeah, lots of rules. But a lot of regions around Israel, when Rome or Greek or the Greeks uh, in ha occupied them, they took on the cultures of the Romans or the Greeks, but the Jews wouldn't do that. So mm -hmm. they were seen as racist. In fact, some of you have heard the story about a woman. They call, we call her the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman in John chapter right. 4. And she, Jesus is talking to her, and she is so surprised that a Jewish man is talking to her that she says, why is it that a Jewish man is talking to me? Because that just doesn't happen. In fact, later on, Peter, heard of. Yeah, Peter admits 
that he'd never step foot in a Gentile house. Mm -hmm. Now, I built all this up to say that this was the context. This is this is the disgust. This is the tension that hangs in the air as this centurion who represents all the oppression of Rome against the Jews. Now, suddenly, this, I mean, it's one thing to heal a, a Jewish man of leprosy, but this man who represented everything that the Jews and Jesus had a right to hate, now he wants a favor from Jesus. <laughs> now he needs a favor. Have you ever been there? <laughs> yes. Have you ever been there where like, maybe you've been there too, where you're out there, Crab Island or AJ's where, you know, wait a minute, you want a job recommendation? No, sorry. After what you did? <laughs> uh, are you kidding me? Or you want to borrow money? You haven't paid me back from the last time. Or I just, I just, you want a second chance? You, you blew the fifth chance. This isn't your second chance. Or you want me to, you want to come stay at my house and the last time you <laughs> st stayed with us, you stole from us. And see, this was exactly Jesus's point. Yeah. Jesus wanted to really build this up. And so in Luke 6, it says, and if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. That's Jesus right. was trying to make the point that it's easy to do good to those who are good to you. Yeah. I mean, even tribes and gangs and cliques, social cliques, like they take care of themselves. Right. They they want to take care and do good for those who take care of them. Yeah. But but it's totally countercultural to take care of somebody that doesn't take care of that's you. Right. In fact, that's what we all have in common because if you if, if if I want you to help a stranger that's never done anything to you, that's all good, right? Sure. Uh, helping someone we don't know, that feels good. But to do something good for someone who's hurt you, I mean, that's, come on, Jesus, that's, that's a lot. That's why we said following, being a Christian, that's easy. But following Jesus, it's going to cost. It's going to cost you. <laughs> and it might cause you to move past something that's, you know, reasonable or what is expected. It's going to be difficult. So anyway, listen, back to the story. So here's Jesus. Here's the centurion. The crowd is, remember, this is, the crowd's following him. What's he going to do? Well, we all know what he's going to do, right? I mean, we've all read the story. Maybe you haven't, maybe, but you can figure out what he's going to do. But it, ultimately, we all have a decision to make. Are we willing to follow Jesus? Are we, or are we content with simply being a Christian? So here's what happens. The centurion, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed. I love this, suffering terribly. <laughs> if you were there, you'd be like, all along, pump the brakes here, pal. Suddenly you're concerned about suffering terribly. You've got some nerve because you right. personify suffering terribly. Our country, our people, my family, we've spent our whole lives suffering because of you. In fact, Jesus was born in a stable because his emperor made him go back. You know, the, the, everyone go back to their hometown. Jesus would eventually suffer because of them. And now you want relief by, from your suffering and you're like, that, that's not right. And think about this. By granting this man's request, Jesus could lose the crowd. I mean, he could definitely lose the patriots. <laughs> but Jesus came to introduce a whole new kingdom. So keeping with these teachings that he just walked away from, he chose to do good for someone who had done imaginable thing, unimaginable things to his people. So Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, to which the people who were there were like, you're right, you don't. No right. one should come under your roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. And then he says something that Jesus commends later on. It's like incredible faith. He said, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. And wow. I think that he probably just pauses and smiles, because everybody's like, <laughs> just like they're this, shocked. Right? Yeah, probably heads back to they're stunned, you know. Probably heads back to Peter's house for lunch. But Jesus wasn't just giving us lip service. Again, he's not like the preacher that preaches how you to live your life and doesn't do it himself. His deeds match his words. His walk matches his talk. But the thing is, this is our point. He expects us to do the same thing. He expects us to do good for those who maybe haven't done good for us. Right. You know, even especially those that don't like us. When And if you think about the how much it costs to be a Jesus follower, it's no wonder we reduce our faith to a label 
because it's so much easier to just be a Christian than it is a Jesus follower. It's so much easier to do good for a stranger than it is someone who's offended you. It's so much easier for me to love those who look like me, love those who live like me, who think like me, and especially those who agree with me. Right. And this is why this is so important. This is why if you choose, if I choose, if we choose not to take that step and follow Jesus, we will actually contribute to some of the challenges that we talked about earlier that we face as a nation. And I'll tell you why. Because when we choose not to take that step and follow Jesus and his example, when you choose not to do that, then you will be content to simply believe. And believing isn't enough because you can believe all the right things. You can believe that God created all people equal and that people, all people have value. And then you can believe that that value comes from God. But you, but when you decide not to follow Jesus and his example, that's where it ends. Right. It ends with just correct belief. Because when you decide that you're not going to take that step to follow Jesus and his example, you will never act. We will never act. We won't act on what we claim we believe, if especially if it costs us something. And we will not react when we see people being treated unfairly and unjustly, especially if it's going to cost us something. You know, it reminds me of a pop culture song by the Migos, uh, and it's called Walk It Like I Talk It. I walk it like I talk it. Jesus is can wanting us. Right I don't know if I can do all of that, but <laughs> but Jesus is asking us to walk it like we talk it. And, and I think Jesus saw this coming, this tension, and he saw that they were going to be shocked by this news. And so even with that, at the very end of this sermon on of the Sermon on the Mount, just like a good English teacher would say, the last sentence needs to be the most impactful. And so Jesus power punches the last bit of his sermon by saying in Matthew 7, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. He knew that these people agreed with what he was saying, but were not ready to walk it out. And so it you know, Jesus knows, okay, you guys are acting foolish. They think they're better than they actually are. And they were fooling themselves with that. And so we have to remember that final ending to that little piece of of scripture that we now read. It's the rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house and the house fell with a great crash. Yeah. So here's what we want to leave with you. The people who made a difference in the world are not the people who just believe right. They are the people who react when something isn't right. So here's what I want, even when it costs them. So here's my invitation to us. Let's not be content with being a Christian. Let's follow. Because when the centurions of life show up and everything in us makes us want to recoil at the thought of of leveraging our resources and our time and our finances to help them. Let's remember that this is the foundation of our faith. This is why Jesus said what he said. And I'm going to read you this last scripture that describes it. And this is why we do this. In Romans 5, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still centurions, Christ died for us. We were all centurions. Christ died for us, and from the pages of the New Testament, he looks back and he says this, follow me. And if you will follow me and my example, we will astonish the world with a brand of love that has the potential to change everything. That's right. Because it's so much easier to be a, Jesus, a Christian than it is a Jesus follower. And the funny thing is, like you said, Jesus never invited anyone to become a Christian. He invites us all to follow especially all of you watching online or at Crab Island or at AJ's. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for sending your son, Jesus, but also sending him as an example that an example of that he didn't come to create Christians. He created, he came to create followers that would follow his example and that, that, and Jesus' example changed the world. It transformed culture. It's even shaped our culture here in America. God, I pray that all of us watching and listening would sit down and examine, are we willing to take that next step, even if it cost us to follow Jesus? And that God, something inside us would not be content with just being a Christian. We love you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thanks for tuning in, you guys. We will see you here next week as we continue this series called Simply Irresistible. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you.